Hello, everybody, and all of the people here in the room. Um, my name is Royal O'Brien. I'm the general manager of digital media and games over at the Linux Foundation. I'm also the executive director of the Open 3D Foundation and the Open Metaverse Foundation. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the metaverse, kind of getting real. Uh, the idea here is to talk about what really exists today, what's really happening today, and other things that we really need or what we think we're dreaming about, or you know, how do they fit into that? So this is kind of a, a talk, an open talk with really anybody about what can we really do? What makes sense? Uh, and I think that's really the main point here. And so uh, kind of everybody do a short introduction on yourselves and we'll kind of hop to it. So you're up first. I'm up first. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, my name is Leo Bongers. Uh, I'm mainly uh, an independent developer. Started my own company end last year, mainly focusing on small volume uh, manufacturing and makers, independent creators, and really trying to focus on that group help them kind of like uh, turn their uh, hobby projects into products they can sell to other people. And next to that, I also uh, focus a lot on Metaverse, try to uh, help build the foundations that uh, to kind of get like a open source foundation to it. Awesome. Great. So I'm Matt White. I am uh, the CEO of Berkeley Synthetic. It's a small private research group focused on the intersection of simulations and uh, AI. Um, I do teach at UC Berkeley. Uh, I also am a co-founder of the OMF from the way back uh, version of it. And uh, I also chair uh, a working group at the Metaverse Standards Forum. So James Hursthaus. Um, I've been in digital media content and infrastructure for about 20 years now. Uh, got my start in Japan uh, in the early days of massively multiplayer online games working with what at the time was half of Nexon. Uh, so really had a front row seat to the Jurassic period of massively multiplayer online gaming. Uh, for me, obviously a precursor of what some people would describe the metaverse to be. Uh, 2007, I uh, was a contributing author to a thing called the Metaverse Roadmap uh, with guys like Philip Rosedale from Second Life and a whole bunch of other folks that are still sort of active in the space. And it's interesting to go back and see what we said in 2007 as to what we would need moving forward uh, in terms of things like high performance cloud and compute, uh, new approaches to 3D and all these kinds of things. And so, you know, here we are in 2023, um, finding out what we got right and what we got wrong. Uh, moved to Canada in 2010 to start a mobile game studio called Roadhouse. And then uh, around 2019, I guess started on my current path. And today now what I'm doing is uh, running a studio called Departure Lounge. And we have, uh, we think, North America's largest, highest resolution volumetric capture stage. Uh, and the main purpose of that is to turn human performances into digital avatars ready for their appearance in the metaverse. And so, you know, Departure Lounge, gateway to the metaverse, and that's what I'm doing now. So that's me. Awesome. So, so kind of everybody has their, their particular areas. And I think a good place for us to start is to talk about digital assets because it kind of crosses everybody. And there's so many different angles we can talk about, such as, you know, how, how are you gonna get them into people's hands? How many of them can you get in their hands? Uh, you know, what's it going to look like when you do that kind of interaction of trade? You know, what, what, what exists, like what have we been able to do today? So from my background in the games industry, you know, we know how many things we can put on the screen at one time. We know some of the assets and characters, but you know, I guess it's really for anybody, what do you think the limitations are today with what we can do and what games do versus what we think we can do or where people are dreaming for it? It's for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I personally think that uh, the limitations are probably quite a lot further than we think technologically wise, uh, but in, to some degree, it's about how much effort you want to put in uh, because you can do quite a lot of LEDing, streaming, uh, and interest management uh, to get really, really detailed worlds with quite a lot of content. Uh, but like the issue ends up being like, okay, well, you need a very sophisticated system for knowing what data you need to stream in and then also getting it very efficiently. Uh, because a very simple world is, well, you can just load it in all at once. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Sure, sure. So I think it's a loaded question. Um, there, uh, there's multi, there's a lot of dimensions to this, right? And so when we talk about digital assets, how do we distill that down, right? Because nearly like anything can be a digital asset. 
And so if we distill it down to like 3D digital assets, right, something that's renderable, um, there, there's certainly a lot of views on, on ownership, right, and like and custody and being able to engage in commerce with your assets. And then when we talk about rendering, you know, being able to load times, right? Like we look at some of the decentralized solutions today, none are really a good fit, in my opinion, for, you know, decentralized, uh, you know, 3D, 3D worlds, right? Virtual worlds. And so- Is it a scale problem or is it a, just an architecture? What, it's, what? it's an architecture issue today, right? So if you look at, um, you know, this might get me burned by a few folks, but um, if you look at, you know, blockchain, right? And we look at NFTs, um, you know, they're, they're effectively providence, right? Like you, you have ownership, but of something at the end of a URL that is not immutable, right? And so if, if we are gonna try and like put a, take a 3D asset, an avatar, have a bunch of LODs with, attached to that and stick it into IPFS, which is running under somebody's table or sorry, under like somebody's desk somewhere, um, that, that, that's not gonna yield a very good experience, right? And so I think, the concept of like a global CDN and, and this idea of like secure storage and and being able to geographically situate or cache assets next, like you know, close to the virtual world in which they're gonna be rendered, I think is gonna be important. Um, there is no solution in the market for that right now. I, I think it's very naive for folks to think that um, we can use some of the existing technology today. I do think that you can absolutely have an NFT and you know, put that up as, as art in your, your, within your virtual space or your virtual home. But I don't think that that is going to scale for um, the needs of, of uh, 3D, 3D virtual worlds, right? So I'm gonna double click on something you just said earlier, but I want James, you can kind of weigh in on that because there's a lot in there. Well, I mean, my reality for the last couple of years has been far less gaming and it's been much more in the realm of uh, virtual production, real-time production. And so, for example, as we look at using Unreal or we look at using Unity or we look at using these scene creators, um, my take on this, my answer to this question probably comes from a different angle than maybe where you wanted to go with the utilization of asset in gaming or massively interactive live event kind of 3D worlds, right? I mean, one of the things we've been trying to do recently is that high performance cloud and compute platform, the ubiquitous thing, but it's a massive is a massive undertaking to try and create that level of ubiquity and that level of, you know, always on lag free latency free computing that you might think that we need. Um, but you know, the answer that I would give in terms of sort of digital asset and the current use case, because you know, out in the hall, we were saying what's real now. I mean, I am sensing, for example, that, uh, you know, if you look at things like even in our wheelhouse with volumetric capture, um, you know, we're creating scans of, of performances Sometimes, you know, uh, a great use case actually was, was last December when the Whitney Houston biopic came out. So the Whitney Houston biopic that came out used volumetric for every extra in that show, right? So it was, I can't say how many millions of dollars worth of volumetric, but it was, uh, it was a lot cheaper and more cost effective and more energy efficient to do it that way than it was to rent Dodgers Stadium or Carnegie Hall and have all of these show, folks show up for real. And I think the next phase of that, for example, is that each of those assets that have been captured volumetrically and now you've got you know a guy dressed as a surgeon for the background of your medical drama, you're not really gonna need to have that guy come in and do a performance again, right? Because that volumetric asset already exists. And the idea of somebody who's now making a movie and using Unreal or whatever, wanting to utilize that asset in the production of that content uh, in the same way that Getty Images works or in the same way that Shutterstock works can start to now go out and look for these different um, elements. And I think what's interesting is, is somebody takes that one asset and says, okay, well, the actor needs to get paid and the guy that designed the costume needs to get paid and this person needs to get paid, that person needs to get paid. I think there is a lot of companies that are starting to emerge now who are using smart contracts to uh, be able to kind of properly divide the royalties or the payments for each of these assets that we're going to start bringing in to these environments. And then obviously I think in the gaming context, what's interesting is that if through, you know, 20 minutes or two hours or 200 hours of gameplay, somebody's interaction with that asset has meaningfully improved it or what have you, still the original creator and the designer of the costume and all these. So, you know, when we were talking outside about where do I see, for example, digital asset 
and the intersection between blockchain and creative. For us, that's our current reality much more than it is about the scalability component that you were trying to address. Um, and if you're obviously, if you're making very, very high end Unreal based uh, digital movies, in a way, compute is not a problem, right? You know, because massive render farms and things like that. And so it's much more about how does the underlying commerce work uh, in conjunction with these 3D assets. And I think, you know, that will eventually find its way over into more sort of gaming and interactive experiences. So um, particularly because now the assets are obviously converged through these single game engines, right? You know. So two things are brought up. Secure storage and smart contracts. What's the reality? I mean, I think the reality on the smart contract side is, is now starting to happen, right? Um, not necessarily quite as far as what I've just described in terms of being people being able to be remunerated sort of on a uh, micro revenue basis for the utilization of their asset in a particular um, uh, movie, for example. Um, but you are starting to see, for example, companies that are going out there and now trying to sort of hoover up the digital rights, for example, to world landmarks, right? So for example, if you want to put the Louvre or you want to put, I don't know, Dodger Stadium into your movie, the idea now of being able to go and obviously acquire that asset, drop it into the background of your scene and utilize it, um, and potentially have that asset change over time, for example, because we're talking real time now. I think the distribution of who needs to get paid for that asset, um, and in some cases that's multiple layers of, of payments that are required, that's real, it's beginning to be real now, right? I'm, I'm a little curious because I think you probably have a different perspective on smart contracts and content, so. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I can talk on end on what I specifically think about the way smart contracts are implemented right now, but I think the most important part for me personally is that like the concept behind it to me is very interesting because yeah, we've got this really complex web of uh, people who really should be getting paid. Um, for example, like actors, we've got currently a big discussion going on uh, of exactly that kind of 3D scanning that is happening of, uh, of extras, basically. And uh, a lot of the, like the um, uh, unions especially are starting to say like, wait, these people need to get paid. Um, and I think that um, myself, I am not a big fan of blockchain and I'm gonna be very honest on that. But I do think that the idea of having that, uh, that system of, uh, the, uh, of it, people actually getting paid, of royalties, having that in some kind of way that you can interpret digitally uh, certainly is a lot better than not having anything at all. And I also think it's very important. Uh, and what, how I think personally, how it should be implemented or not, it's a little bit more besides the point, uh, as long as you do have that system. Because I do think that that is the incredible valuable part that I personally really care about. Yeah, I think you're right. Because you have to imagine a future in which you know, the situation is better than where we're at now, which is, you know, actors typically are bought out, you know, extras are bought out. And yet at the same time, many folks who want to make movies wouldn't be able to use the range of acting talent that could be available to them if they knew that they were able to pay for that talent over a period of years based on success. So if all of a sudden this movie is now a 200 million, 300 million dollar movie, you know, ideally, if you think about it, the remuneration for everybody in it and all of the people that participate, it should be more than the full buyouts. Um, and so does that engender a whole new era of creativity where it's more democratized because you don't have to pay for, you know, a thousand extras at the beginning uh, and you pay them when it's, the movie's a success, maybe. And then the next question is, you know, if that extra is now in a movie and I use AI, uh, generative AI, to change the appearance of that initial performance, is it that actor anymore? So somehow there has to be a relationship between the underlying performance and the iteration of that or the manifestation of that performance on the screen which also is very challenging when you sort of think about it. So I reckon that if we really try and fight for this future in which that type of remuneration is possible, um, you know, then it is a better democratized, more creative uh, future, right? Um, and then that probably, I think, would come spill back over into games and interactive experiences as well. Uh, but initially, I think that the, the um, that kind of revolution is gonna come more from uh, screen entertainment and linear than it probably is from interactive, just because it's easier, right? Yeah, so it, I, I fundamentally and philosophically agree. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Practically, it, it, it's it's a little. It's there. I think like in the if the studios are going to share assets, right? Like decentralized digital asset management. There's a sort of a honesty policy between amongst them, right? Because today with the technology, I can take a 3D asset off chain, and it's even if it is encrypted on the other end, uh, which it never is, um, I can pass that around, use that, and then it's gone, right? There's n there's no remuneration for anybody that's involved in in that process, right? So if if that there were several like artists that were there and they produced some asset together. Now it's gone, right? It just it's like if I go and bought it from one of these um, you know marketplaces, right? And so if I bought it from a three D asset marketplace, I can share it and it's on torrents and so forth. So I, I do, and even Royal and I talked about this last year, which was I do think that there needs to be some form of digital rights management that has to be bound to these assets and gaming is seriously complicated because we need to be able to load these assets real time, right? And we need to be able to load the appropriate LODs. Um, and we don't want to be wasteful. We don't want to load LODs we're not going to use. And so there, there has to be, uh, it's just, it's a different use case, right? But I think fundamentally the same technology can serve all purposes, um, but we're, we're just not, not there yet, right? I mean, secure, you know, and by the way, anybody can ask questions at any time better here, but secure storage and digital asset management. I mean, here's the thing. Um, what makes you think you can secure it that I can't get it? It's not impervious, right? Because I can, I can, I can't crack Netflix's DRM, but I can scrub and make a, co a copy of it, right? <laughs> of the entire film. So it, but what it does is it creates this, um, like, you know, fundamental legal liability, right? That you have made the effort to circumvent the security that's in place. And, you know, there, that's fundamentally what digital rights management does. I mean, it, it slows down the process. And, uh, and, but nothing to date, I have not seen any technology that can't be defeated and bring in quantum computing and, um, you know, the entire blockchain is decrypted. Yeah, we have a question. <laughs> Should have thrown the phone. <laughs> it's, my phone about the mic. it's not like the cubes we threw around before, but it's good. Um, now that I've embarrassed myself uh, thoroughly. Uh, so on the digital, uh, I, I'm sorry that we came in late um, in case you already addressed this. Um, the On the digital rights uh, management issue of, of assets, I'm wondering, I've been thinking about this uh, in, in a broader way as well, about like a, a post-truth world, a post-economics you know, economics in, in this way where like, what does it mean? Is it possible for a world where, like, I was inspired by your talk specifically about the fan economy and, and the creator economy and that. And isn't it possible for people who are enjoying the content to reward the people who are creating the content? And they are, there are kind people, there are loving people in this world who are doing that without a fucking law <laughs> and a legal basis for everything, for, for, for you know, suing each other. I, I, wonder, I wonder if a fear-based economy is preferable to a fan economy where people are, you know, uh, paying. You see the entire economy is creating mm -hmm. for ridiculous things, which would be ridiculous to me, not to them, rewarding people who created it without a threat of, you know, law on top of them. You ever use Patreon? Uh, sure. Ta-da. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the whole point of it is that, you know, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about DRM though. You, you guys are talking about legal liability. And I think what you specifically were saying, were saying was like, a certain liability that is created on you because you copied a Netflix well, film that my, they can sue you. So mine wasn't more, it wasn't really from that perspective. It was this just- That's why I'm asking, yeah. Well, I mean, I think what we was, what I was trying to get across is the idea of having 20, 25, 30, maybe a hundred people having had an influence in a single asset that's evolved over time. So it's not really about saying, well, who's gonna get caught out? And I think you're right that there has to be a social contract between people. It's a, it's a different paradigm where people are willing to sort of say, okay, on a pay-per-view basis, I'm going to re be receiving micro, 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 remun micro remuneration for my role in having created whatever tiny percentage of that particular thing that's being viewed has been. But because it's so ubiquitous and because many people are looking at it, other people are influencing it, um, that there is some mechanism through which, you know, c creators 
individual creators, contributors um, can be remunerated somehow. That I think is the most right? interesting point to me is if you, if you I, I, I'm sorry, sorry, because I missed the early part of the conversation, but if you are talking about blockchains and some kind of a real true ledger on which you can track the contributions of so many people, like like you look at the writer's strike and all these things happening, like like then you truly could have the fans or the people consuming the content rewarding directly the people who are creating the That's content, what, yeah, exactly. right? as opposed to yeah. the current fear-based economy in which still the artists don't get paid um, and the studios are, and whoever whatever is involved are getting all the, you know, running away to the bank. So uh, I feel like there, there is that the case always gets made for artists are getting screwed, let's do digital DRM, copyright, take down all this stuff. And at the end, we are still not any closer. You know, like we, we, we did Napster and now we have Spotify. So I just feel like whenever people get into this conversation, I like to bring back to reality of like the philosophy of DRM and then the reality of the world we live in. Well, I mean, so Spotify uh, is a different paradigm, right? Like uh, artists are compensated, right? It, it's tracked, there's legal agreements in place. Um, the, uh, so you weren't here for it, but I did say I agree with the with decentralization and, and, and uh, compensating creators, right? And, and giving ownership to users. Um, so let me, let me ask you a question. If you spent considerable amount of time creating this amazing avatar, right? You you designed it yourself. Um, I'm going to cut out generative AI for a second because it'll change some things. Um, but let, let's say you, you spent a lot of time on that and or you spent a lot of money buying that avatar. Uh, how, how are you going to feel about the fact that you've amassed millions of, of followers, right? There's millions of people like metaverse twitch streaming you and you know you've got this avatar and everybody's following you around and you're doing your thing how are you going to feel if suddenly the metaverse is full of your avatar right i think that is exactly the question at the heart of this is people keep asking about like someone is copying you and that is stealing and that is like somehow law like there's loss like i feel like that there is the opposite which is there are they are your fans like yeah, these are the people that you inspired. They're not leaving you for the other person. And I would you say know. I'd be pretty happy about that yeah. as long as I got a micro remuneration for everybody every time that somebody had used my image, right? Yeah. And again, yeah. uh, you know what you're saying too. And sorry, just one really quick point with Spotify. The problem with Spotify is that it doesn't actually do the full decentralized thing. It pays the rights holder for the music, mm -hmm. who in turn keeps an unnecessary piece. So the record label gets paid by Spotify, who in turn keep all of that stuff and pay the artist. And what we're saying here is if you imagine a Spotify where the seven people and the musicians who actually played on the track, all, you know, like imagine every time you listen to Spotify, the middleman was disintermediated and it did pay the 13 people who actually had a role in the creation of that track, right? That, that's, because Spotify I think is, a, is not really the right parallel in what we're talking about because it's still got the middlemen in there who are greedy along the way. And we're trying to sort of imagine this utopia where there's a direct consumer creator relationship without those folks in the middle. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, I think there's a bit of an interesting point in there because uh, when we're talking specifically the example of, say you've got like your special avatar as like a Twitch streamer and you see a bunch of other people using these avatars. Well, I was saying personal experience talking to these people who are doing Twitch streaming, YouTube streaming. Uh, they probably just wouldn't care uh, because in the end, like, that's not particularly their business. Uh, and I think that for a big part, what we are missing with, like, these digital contracts as well is for the most part, uh, it seems to me like uh, most people don't seem to really care about the very strict enforcement part. Rather, they just want the people who are playing in good faith to uh, be able to track this stuff and to do the payment because as I showed in my presentation, we've got fans that are very, very passionate, very willing to reward these creators uh, entirely through donations. Um, so I think the actual, like the, the programmatically tracking part of smart contracts is, I think we're going to see a lot of positive reception to that. Uh, but there are a lot of problems with the way we're currently approaching it with blockchain in the way the implementation work. And I think a lot of creators also say like, well, we can't really ever truly perfectly enforce this. So why are we having this gigantic overhead with a bunch of additional people in between and a bunch of additional costs in between? Yeah, I think one of the things that actually came up in the conversation that I had today was one of the questions I hit somebody in the audience, which was about likeness and the ability to protect it. 
So, you know, I dress in a particular outfit. I've got, you know, the, the red furry hat and the big fly things and the polka dotted boots. And I put it out there and I'm a streamer and I've got millions of people that actually know that outfit, you know, of what I wear. And then all of a sudden other people just decide I'm going to dress like that too. And I'm going to try and, you know, change that identity, you know, mess with that identity, somehow steal that identity of what it is. Is it really protectable? How does that come into play? Are you taking revenue out of their pockets? How does that, there's a lot of avenues that come along with it because, and here's the thing, even if that, those intellectual property pieces, you know, the, the hat, the gloves, whatever it is, even if they bought them off of a store, the fact that they combined them together to create that unique outfit, um, is that protectable? How far does it go? At what point? At what scale? Um, so, so there's actually a lot more questions that go along with it. And then how do you kind of enforce that? I think those are great questions. I think but my, my, if I can, my opinion, which may be the dumbest, but I certainly have thought about this stuff. My opinion would be, what is this whole talk about protection? And like, I feel like that is the biggest, like that is what they use. It is not what artists use. Let's just be clear. This is the language that the business people use. So let's just not muddy the water with like protection. Like the artists are not being protected with any of this. It's the people, like if you, if you were truly to bring a community of artists together, none of them, if they have the artist spirit, which I would they would not be the people saying, let's sue people for, for being wanting to be like me. And this whole idea of, uh, you know, trademarking and patenting and, and trying to sue people over this shit is not coming from this. It's coming from the business people who know they can make a lot more money on top of artists' work. So I just want to clarify, like, I don't think that is the case. <laughs> like, I am, I am so happy to hear those two differing views together on the panel because I, I wasn't expecting to. <laughs> I do need to, of course, uh, say that, like, my perspective that I've had, I've been very lucky to talk to a large group of Twitch streamers, YouTubers, but I do need to, with that, clarify, of course, that uh, I do not have the entire picture, uh, and mostly it's, like, more on the gaming, VTuber side, and even with that, it's just a small subset of it, so I cannot speak for everyone. I do need to add that. I can just give a bit of context of the people I know. Sorry, I mean, there's a couple of good examples, right, where it works quite well, even in the current situation or in the current scenario, current format, um, where I think, you know, again, if you use these things as examples as to how it can become more democratized, more open to individual creators, more sm smaller things, right? So, for example, um, you know, like everybody knows I'm a big Maiden fan, Iron Maiden, right? And it always comes to Iron Maiden. But there's a band called the Iron Maidens. There's about seven or eight different Iron Maiden tribute bands. Iron Maidens being an all-female Iron Maiden tribute band. And they do that with the full blessing of the band. And the band likes it because every time they play, you know, they get royalties from the songs. There's publishing rights, all these kinds of things. Similarly, I think, with, with things like Guitar Hero, if you think of the success, particularly for guys like Slash, who became, I mean, you know, it's talk, talking about iconic... S silhouettes like Jamiroquai, very iconic silhouette. Alice Cooper, obviously, very uh, iconic makeup, right? And so those things, I think, have been the preserve of bigger companies that were able to look at that and go, actually, this is in the interest of the artist to a certain degree because by licensing those things out. So, I, again, I think what we're talking about here is a much more democratized situation where even smaller, smaller artists can enjoy the same kind of uh, benefit by using automated smart contract, in my opinion, right? And so it's no longer the preserve of somebody that happens to be on, you know, like Geffen or Warner Brothers. It can be those types of opportunities become a lot more democratized and open for a lot more people. Um, and if we can achieve that, then it starts to become a much more, you know, caring environment. And so I agree with you when you look at it, you say, well, obviously the incumbents have got a lot to lose if we manage to democratize this direct consumer audience, uh, sorry, creator audience relationship, right? and they're trying to hold on to it, but anyway. So I, I will say that there is a distinction between appreciation and impersonation, right? And so you can appreciate a band and you know play cover songs. Now, impersonation, and this is I'm probably getting ahead of Royal's questions here, um, but with, with generative AI being something of a game changer here, I hate that word, um, yeah. That's like my least favorite word in the world. Uh, the, I think um, I'd love to live in this u u utopian world where it, it didn't matter, right? But people, to your point, need to be compensated for their work. And so whether that is an individual, whether that is a company, it doesn't matter, right? It, it, if you create something, you should be compensated for it. If you want to, yeah. Right. And so, 
yes, just throw it in the public domain if you want. If you don't want, what, why are you putting it on the blockchain if you, yeah, right? Yeah. If you don't want to be compensated yeah, for it, right? Oh, no, I'm going to throw a complete monkey wrench into this, so you might want to finish this yeah. thought. I, I, did, I did want to. Uh, I did want to add on to that a little bit because uh, I've been vocal about this as well. And there's like a lot of open source developers who are vocal about this, uh, which is that uh, in open source, we're not really seeing a lot of the, um, of the money come back to the open source developers who are enabling a lot of uh, stuff right now. And it's the same problem as with, the, uh, with actors not getting royalties for the stuff they're doing. And I think that's like there's a lot of cool overlaps there. But it's also really interesting is um, taking it back to the content creators. A lot of them are saying like, well, we're using all this existing IP content. We don't really have permission to use it. The only reason we get to use it is because the companies just aren't going after us. And it's kind of like this kind of gray market area. They would be benefit quite a lot from having certainty on that. I want to hear the monkey wrench. Okay, so the monkey wrench is coming completely away from creatives. And let's talk about industrial metaverse. Let's talk about 3D assets in that realm where DRM isn't so much about remuneration and, and paying the creatives. It's about, hey, this factory that is, is in a, you know, an industrial metaverse situation, and how do you val validate life safety things so that that factory may get copied and used to, as a model for another factory? And how do you make sure that that doesn't get changed? How do you make sure that you know there's not intellectual property that's stolen from you know efficiencies in factory? It's like it, it's, it's it's the same things you folks are talking about, but more along the lines of how do you protect kind of the um, not the creative look and feel so much, but but the way things uh, operate in reality, right? The physics, all that stuff. I'm, it's kind of funny when you, you bring that up because what's a little more scarier than that is what if I replicate the same exact uh, factory and I put another site and I redirect you there and you think you're actually controlling the factory in the meanwhile, you're doing something to somewhere else or having no effective ability to do it. Right, that's the it. digital twin piece, right, is how yeah. you validate the IO, that the IoT, IoT sensors are actually feeding back from the thing that you think they're feeding back from. Right. In the digital twin, yeah. So in other words, you're, you're basically, you know, somewhere there's a pressure gauge that's going off the roof, uh, you know, going off the, uh, the rails, and you're like, oh, I just need to turn this knob over here. But the problem is you're not even in your digital twin that you should be. And as a result, that thing's going to blow itself apart because you didn't realize you weren't even there in the right place because it was an exact copy. Can, can, I, can I just end, end this game when you don't know you're fighting a battle? Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I just quickly ask, so you mentioned what if uh, that, like, I'm wondering what if is supposed to, like, so what if you do that, which is fraud and criminal already, if you, you know, do this, like, create a factory, for, you go to jail or something, like, there's already laws for this. Yeah, who's I gonna, didn't say throw who's gonna, us. Who's going to prosecute? Where are you going to get who's prosecuted? Who's going to prosecute fraud? No, who's, who's going to, where are you going to get prosecuted? For, for what? For creating a factory for, yeah. like, a, and endangering people? Yeah, what's your jurisdiction? This is not about intellectual property. I'm, I'm talking about intellectual yeah. property as you being a ridiculous paradigm. We're not talking about intellectual property. You create We're talking a about building a factory. What, what, is the, what is being done here? Is it like you build a factory that, like, does Tesla's work and makes more cars for people and cheaper cars? Or are you doing something that damages and hurts people? If you're doing something that hurts people, you go to jail for, or you could get prosecuted for hurting people. If you are creating cheaper cars by using some technology that was you know, proprietary, then you're making cheaper cars. And the people who you're making cheaper cars for won't want you to be prosecuted, so you better be in a country where you're not going to get prosecuted. Yeah, you're focused on the IP. I, I want to hear your, yeah. your comment. You're focused on the, I, on the IP angle. I think I'm more focused on what Royal is saying, which is it's the life safety pieces of it, right? Which is that, is, do you know that that digital twin is the one that you think it is? And it's it's a to me, it's a different use case than the remuneration. I can't even say that. Remuneration <laughs> use case. It's more along the lines of how do you, how do you validate the the provenance of that thing, at, uh, that it is what it, oh, yeah, what you say it is. Go ahead. The legitimacy, that's I, the word I was looking for. I think to one, uh, to some degree, um, my personal answer to that would be to some degree, at the very least, uh, making sure it's on your own servers. Because <laughs> there is right. like, you're, when you're introducing another third party, like it introduces a whole bunch of lists of different issues as well. Uh, but also we have, uh, going to like, what do we have right now? We have a large collection of pretty good approaches to making sure that whatever server you're talking to is a server you think it should be. Um, there are, there's, and that is such an incredibly complex topic with so many ways for it to make like really subtle mistakes where absolutely disaster stuff can happen. And I would say like, 
um, being able to go after it after the fact from like a legal perspective is one thing, but like in the very moment, if you're turning the wrong knob, people's lives are at risk. So it's incredibly critical to get that right. So I, I'm not going to mention anything legal for the rest of this uh, session. <laughs> um, so in, a, in the industrial metaverse, it's, it's still decentralized, right? And so if you have it, it, the putting on your own server thing is, is, is kind of nice in concept, but in, in practicality, not so much, right? Because one, we'll be in the cloud. we got the cloud, yeah. right? Two, they're in supply chain or in certain, you know, you may have multiple companies that have their parts of this uh, supply chain, right? And so some something may be happening with a set of, you know, digital twin of some part of the factory, right? And some widgets are made and, and that entire factory is, you know, all the sensors are being streamed back to the digital twin. And there is some partnership between s these different companies and they're able to, you know, streamline process within the digital twin space and this sort of thing. And so you still need this, you still need some form of protection, in my opinion, to be able to ensure not, not just the, um, like, company secrets, right? You, you certainly don't want someone to be able to just go in. There's this, you know, shared network, let's say it's a federate, federated network and not a decentralized network. There's these assets in there and each company needs to be able to, to see them and to be able to pull sensor data or whatever. So we need encryption, right? That, that's a foregone conclusion. Um, but identity, decentralized identity, right? We have this sort of, you know, untrusted network and everybody should be able to access what they need out of there and validate it with, with you know, zero proof type scenarios. And, um, and I think that's what helps sort of facilitate the industrial metaverse is that like, we don't necessarily need to trust everybody, but we can trust that what we're getting is is legitimate, right, and valid. I think it's kind of interesting if you think it, some of the talks today that were brought up was that the um, identity model of being able to have you uh, communicate with an endpoint, and instead of it going from kind of like uh, the issuer to you to the validator and coming back, the reality is that by you being able to work directly with it and creating a secure channel itself, is probably going to be your only means of making sure you have a secure environment. Because if you trust the server, it's not like we've seen the big metaverse padlock, you know, on our browser, okay? You haven't seen one of those. So I think the fact of having digital identity mixed along with what you're trying to get identity to create that secure channel that's not just a generic HTTPS um, is going to be essential because when somebody can pierce that veil, you could be sent anywhere, especially if you're using a distributed cloud environment, which is going to send you to whatever node is open and available. You can't guarantee it's going to be on a server because, of course, I've got thousand other people running the same facility. So I think the uh, digital identity and being able to secure a channel of communication is probably going to be one of the most essential elements. Right. And I think your point is valid, which is that having it on your own servers is nice, but it doesn't scale, right? We're at the point to be able to do this, to Matt's point, it needs to be federated, it needs to be able to scale, it needs to be in, able to be in the cloud, and it needs to be something that you can be 100% sure that that's the digital twin that, you're, that you are um, actually wor working with and interacting with. Yeah, I think one point with there, just one moment, we're gonna get to you after, just one, one thing. Uh, <laughs> one thing uh, with it that's interesting, like when I say on your own server, that doesn't necessarily mean your own hardware. Uh, but also, of course, we are also seeing other issues bringing in by having it be a spatial interface, which is not only do you need to make sure you're talking to the correct server, you also need to make sure that the dial you're looking at uh, isn't being like, that there's not like a little dial being rendered over that by the little Kanban board app that's being used in the room next over. Uh. <laughs> or, or, the, or the fact that imagine if the copy of that what it is isn't really in front of you but is behind you a spatial environment I could put it 10,000 feet behind you and you don't even know it's there but yet you're in the same place so there's just quickly one on that topic um, so there's one piece of this equation that I didn't mention which is like contracts like multi-sig contracts so where you come into an agreement with X number of different parties right this is what allows you to to basically execute that contract that might be tied to the encryption and being able to decrypt only the parties that are involved have the ability to decrypt the asset right and maybe the data streams that are you know going to Kafka or whatever are are encrypted 
you know, point to point encryption perhaps, but the actual assets and the ability to, and, and when we think about like digital assets, I mean, this can be other things too, right? Not just 3D rendered objects, yeah. right? And so it could be um, anything that you want to allow in a, a third party to access, right? And so I think we need to, um, I don't want to get too far off the topic, yeah. but there's in the industrial metaverse, there's certainly other applications and other things that we can share between trusted parties. Oh yeah, so we got one last question since I don't want to run us too far over time. Do you have a question? Uh, I have many questions. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> but do you have the answers? I probably have the answers. Okay. All right. Um, the, for one, I'm a Kung Fu teacher. So when uh, you're talking about perception and flipping things around on people, um, that's actually a, a neuro training technique, um, and it is learnable. Um, the uh, elements that we talked about in you not knowing where you were um, in regards to uh, accessing one terminal, which may be accessing a false terminal. Um, we have, and, and I kind of had this question a little bit earlier with the IBM gentleman, um, one from the blockchain side and one from the quantum side, and my question to them was, um, assuming within the next three or four years quantum computing chainsaws the encryption that blockchain uses, um, who will be leading blockchain tech uh, in the future? Will it be blockchain technologists or quantum technologists? Um, since the question uh, never got answered, I'm assuming that was the answer. Um, I believe that uh, one of the elements that are missing in this, for, first and foremost, uh, in regards to metaverses, we have a host of building information modeling and CAD and elevation knowledge and domain expertise, which is 100% absent from this. Um, trying to work with them is just going to give you a, a, a smattering of proprietary tools which don't overlap. Um, as far as security goes, uh, we have multi-sig, but we don't have uh, multi-GP rendering across parties, so every person will have a full copy of the, whatever model or 3D asset you've produced uh, and a memory uh, a dump will extract it, blockchain or encryption or not. Um, a lot of the, the missing elements in the blockchain side exist with this concept called oracles, um, but they lack the computer vision to be able to say, this is a thing, I see it, it hasn't moved because I'm doing change detection every frame and every pixel is being monitored. So being able to uh, compensate with this, you know, inability of differentiating whether or not you're looking at security uh, fidelity or security noise, I think needs to be compensated by possibly a new internet. Because I'll give you a little bit of a really, really old school background. There was a concept called freaking. Uh, it's not a sexual reference. The, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. So that, that was enabled and then stopped. Uh, it was enabled because uh, a 2600 hertz uh, in-band signaling process would be triggered and you could then control the phone lines. Mm -hmm. At some point, that became out of band signaling and there was no more red boxes, there was no more freaking, there was nothing like that. Uh, if, you'll, if you look at the internet, we still have in-band signaling on intranets, we only have out-of-band signaling on extranets. Um, so, at this point, you, you can have an AI on your network that can simulate you. So at Right, so that now we're getting towards to, to the nitty gritty where, you know, you don't want to be, uh, well, for example, I run uh, a Discord server, so a lot of people like to pretend they're me and then go after other users. Discord itself has no internal facility for me to be able to say, hey, no, that's, that's, that guy's not me. Um, and I think that's what's missing on our internet. Well, yeah, there's, there's, <clears throat> You get like five questions there, by the way. So we're gonna start. We're gonna we're gonna start for the first one. The first one, cat and mouse game. Old school doesn't matter. So your answer: Who wins? Quantum versus blockchain? Give you a hint. Nobody. You know why? Because quantum because quantum will beat block, and then somebody will beat quantum, and it's a never-ending race. So the answer of why it's neither is because neither can be winners because whoever the next generation of what we don't know and don't understand will become the next winner who will become that infinite loop. So, and, and we know this, it's the common argument. You well, know, we, I can we, we do, we do have the general statement that there are no unhackable systems. 
I sure. am I am one of the creators of an unhackable drone system the Air Force uses that uses quantum entanglement. So there are ways of using technology. Until somebody breaks it. Until technology. But the so problem that's, is, that's the problem with your statement is that you said course. it was unbreakable, but that's not the case because right. that is improbable. But what is the probability of breaking Heisenberg uncertainty? So at some point we've hit a wall that we're not going to break for another thousand years. What you know. Of course. Well, uh, <laughs> well there's uh, an, an old joke created that of what is the, what is the, how secure is that uh, system? Well, it's as, it's as secure as a $5 wrench. Yes. That's the XKCD. Right. I actually met, I mentioned that one a little bit earlier. <laughs> I said, if I hit you in the head with a uh, hammer a couple of times and ask you for your PIN code, which is more effective, that or your encryption? Right. <laughs> now, I forget what your other questions were. Because What was your second question? So the other new question internet. was when What's you were... That? We need a new internet. We need a new I internet. Ask question, like, why we need we computer need vision. Oh, the video oracles. payload. Oh, I remember. The you were saying the distributed multiple GPU. Multiple GPU. That right. one's easy I, to address. Yeah, okay. That <laughs> one's... Oh, so here's the funny thing. I actually did an experiment back in the 2000 on this. And what I did was I had multiple machines. And you don't even know this. This is a really cool one. But um, I had multiple machines that were running uh, GPUs. And what I was doing was I was actually taking each one and split the scene into objects. Mm -hmm. I'd render the scene past the video, put the overlay behind it, render the next one on the next machine with an iframe delay, and then send it the next and the next. And the ultimate result was I rendered a full 3D frame with four different machines that were near real time of graphics across a distributed environment and used my back payload of video to accomplish it. So can you do it? Yes. So no, you're, 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 Point is well taken. You're you're paralyzing a workload, and that's 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 an amazing way of creating efficiency. But what I'm saying is, is if, assuming we've broken this uh, this encryption, uh, assuming we have a computer's memory profile, but we have what we ha have as a DRM'd 3D model. So now, if if you look at all the 3D model standards, GLTF, all these, they don't include. Hey, how can a a GPU render this without compromising the internal structure in such a way that it can just be copied. I mean, reality is that when you're talking about this object, it's still set of vector coordinates of where you do that. Exactly. In, in so the, space. So the primitives fall down into something that's very easy to copy, just like. Sure. It always is. That's that's the thing. And you were saying like CAD CAM and not being able to translate that, but the reality is that those all those all translate across anyways. I mean, we right. do that all the time now with Dassault's, uh, uh, what the hell is it called? Because of an S. Um, you know what I'm talking about? And, and so we do that for, for modeling because that's how we strip them down right. into 3D models that we, that we 3D print with. Right. And they all start from base. They, they, I mean, you can get them from either or. So doing that translation is super easy. Um, you don't even need to do – literally, you can use the AMP, ASIMP library that's open source to do the whole thing and call it a day. So CAD CAM, translation, 3D objects, all that stuff, we've got that now. That, that's a breeze. Um, and as for, you know, when you're talking about DRM and that, but – you didn't say that the parallelization of the GPU had to have a decrypted payload in between because I can replicate the same exact payload to four different machines with, a, mm -hmm. with the same key existent in a private uh, public key type system right. and accomplish that task without having to do any kind of corruption. Right, but you could also do a multi-card computation. So well, that sure, it's same machine, but it's, it's a matter of whether you're doing it in a distributed environment, which is kind of like when you start right. doing sharded environments for large-scale replication right. of objects within a uh, simulated space. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you want to do it, let's just say you're doing large-scale simulation in a space, and I've got 1,000 people. And our big problem here is that the compute um, has to be distributed. So how would I do that, right? Well, I would get a whole lot of memory that can hold all of it, and I'd put it on a box. And then I would turn around and page back that entire thing, and I'd pass the memory pointer, that shared page memory, into nine different instances that have a certain number of CPUs to it. And I would allow it to float from system to system, machine to machine, uh, basically harvesting and slicing it as the compute load moves from place to place, but have a zero latency because I'm doing it all in line on the same memory map spot. And then I can replicate objects in and out of band through network replication. And there you go. That's millions of things moving in and out with an efficient memory model that actually does that. So same thing plays when you're talking about scaling GPU objects. Right. Well, I mean, we, we, we start to lose some of the efficiency abilities that you can do with those things as you start to add security to it. My, my question was, or my comment was really more related to the, to the multi-sig primitive doesn't really exist outside of wallets. It doesn't exist for a 3D model, an avatar, an asset, audio. No, none of that exists today, right? We were, yeah. uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about how the system that is in place, like blockchains, I'm not even convinced that blockchains will scale to the metaverse, right? I, I think like direct acyclic graft is a m superior technology and, uh, and that, that's the kind of direction we have to take, right? Or, we can have blockchains in the metaverse, right? There's no harm in that. But do you think there's going to be like one blockchain to rule them all? I'm not mentioning the name of a company. Um, 
you know, that, that's not going to happen. And so it doesn't exist today, right? And to throw sort of a monkey wrench in everything is, is like, are we going to be doing client-side rendering or are we going to do cloud-side rendering, right? And, and if we do cloud-side rendering, let's say, then we pull an asset, 3D asset off the chain and then we decrypt it, right? Through that multi-sig contract, we have this asset here. We're going to render it and we're sent, now we're sending a DRM encrypted video stream down to the client, right? Which is, that's a harder uh, task to defeat because you're just getting a two-dimensional image at the client side, right? Or you're getting frames, exactly, right? Right, right. And so that's probably an easy, uh, a, a more robust model, but uh, is that, I don't know what, you know, client side computation is gonna be in the future, right? And then I think it goes back to your point about whether or not in the majority of cases, majority of people, do they really want to be so nefarious that they deny the original creator of the asset from the money that we all believe they should be paid, right? No, so to a certain degree. Sorry, after I finally understood is like the security aspect of it, like you're running as Amazon a warehouse or whatever you're doing, while you're in prep for it and you're working with digital twin only, you need to secure all your assets. That's a different problem than worrying about copying of renders or, or copying of like the 3D model. Like that's a irrelevant issue. You got you got a you got a copy of the of the the shelf at a store. Like that's not the point. The point is like securing that it's the correct information. That's a different question than someone got an asset of the shelf and now they on in their house they 3D printed a Amazon warehouse shelf. Those are two very different problems. You know, so, so I just want to clarify that the, well, we, we're discussing, we're muddling two different ways. One is about protocol. You could just entirely achieve it by an encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, the, the zero-proof stuff. Keep, keep, the in, mind, stuff, keep right? in mind one thing. You're talking about yeah. 3D assets and all the stuff in the metaverse of what we're doing, right? Everybody's going to have a copy of it anyways, whether it's encrypted or not encrypted. Mm -hmm. The only thing that stops it is the lack of presentation from the server side and the coordinate. Because if I don't give you X, Y, Z, or if I don't give you TRS coordinates of where that thing's in space, and I'm running around with everybody else, and I don't tell you where that hat fits on my head, that hat could be in no man's land and you will never see it because if the server never transmit the identity or the coordinate space of what you're supposed to see, it never transmits. You never see it. You're the only one who sees it on your local computer because the server has to transmit the coordinate space to the other thousand people on the actual server to actually see it show up. It has to be tracked and sent to you in real time in coordinate space. So keep that in mind. You can have a copy of all this stuff. Do you really, it only becomes a problem when everyone else can see it. When you're the only one who sees it, nobody cares. But no one else would see it because you hmm? wouldn't transmit it. That, that's the point. My so, point is that we're so yes, worried about, we're so worried about the asset on the hard drive. Yeah. That's not the worry point. The worry point is actually, but, how do you keep it from the replication system? My, my point is precisely that we're, just, we're talking about a problem that isn't, isn't, isn't even a thing. Like, cause, cause most likely, like you said, the very first point, which is like you host that information on your own server or something very centralized. Most people would do that. There is no reason to put that information, the most critical inf online, but all the assets and a large piece of information, let's say you're on your mobile device as a CEO sitting somewhere or whatever, you're chief operation person, and you wanna see that, I, I can understand, but I was saying two very different problems. One is about securing that you're seeing the right true picture. The other is the asset being like, you know, copied and. And one last, I'm gonna give, I guess, uh, last thoughts and last comments because we're definitely murdering our overtime <laughs> here. It's a good conversation, yeah. but you guys can go ahead and finish up. Love it. Yeah, just to uh, finish my thoughts on that, it's like Daniel, if I well, uh, put on your own server, why would you put it anywhere else? Well, the actual data, I would say, is like one of the very large issues we're uh, getting right now already with the internet is delivering just huge swaths of data all across the internet to all around the world. And, uh, well, at a certain point, you just, like, if you are hosting stuff yourself, you just do not have the resources to deliver that volumes of data. And even, it's going to get even worse. And we're essentially getting the entire world in something that's the equivalent of a high-end video game. I'll say one quick thing, which is, if we're designed, if we're building the metaverse for a single use case, we're in trouble, right? <laughs> what do you got, James? That's all. I'll say one thing. Thank God for Hazy Pale Ale. All right, and that's what we got. James. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank <laughs> <laughs>